let's look at an introduction to inference for the ratio of two population variances. We'll look at confidence intervals and hypothesis tests based on the assumption of normally distributed populations. And a warning up front, these methods can work very poorly when the normality assumption is violated, so it's always a bit sketchy using them. Let's take a brief look at an example. The ratio of the length of the second digit, the index finger, to that of the fourth digit, the ring finger, known as the 2D to 4D ratio, is often studied by researchers. This ratio is related to fetal exposure to testosterone, and it has been linked to characteristics like aggression. A study investigated possible differences in the distribution of the 2D to 4D ratio in children born to parents who were first cousins, and children born to parents who were not related. The researchers investigated the distribution for males and females, but we'll only look at males in this video. Here are the box plots of the 2D 4D ratio for 122 males born to parents who are first cousins, and 142 males born to parents who are not related. The male children in the study were all of high school or university age when they had this ratio measured. One of the major points of interest in this study was seeing if there was a difference between the groups in the mean 2D 4D ratio, which is probably the most natural point of interest but the researchers were also interested in a possible difference in the variance. Visually, it looks like the males born to parents who were related may have more variability in their 2D-40 ratios compared to males born to non-related parents. There appears to be more spread in the box plot on the left than the box plot on the right. That's what it looks like, but we'd like to carry out an appropriate statistical analysis. If we use our usual sample variance formula on the raw data, we'd find that the sample variance for the related parents group is 0 .00072, and the sample variance for the unrelated parents group is 0 .00038. The ratio of sample variances, S1 squared over S2 squared, estimates the ratio of population variances, sigma1 squared over sigma2 squared. We deal with the ratio of variances, and not the difference between the variances, for a couple of reasons. First, under certain conditions, like normality, the ratio of sample variances has a nice, clean distribution that we'll discuss in a moment. Very often, ratios of statistics have ugly distributions that are not easy to deal with, but under normality, the ratio of sample variances is easy to work with. Secondly, the ratio is very meaningful for variances. If the ratio of sample variances is 8, say, then one variance is 8 times as large as the other. That's a nice, simple, meaningful interpretation. But as is usually the case in statistics, it's not enough to simply report a point estimate, the value of the ratio of sample variances. We often want to use inference techniques to say as much as we can about the ratio of population variances. Common points of interest lie in constructing a confidence interval for the ratio sigma1 squared over sigma2 squared, and we may also wish to test a hypothesis about the value of the ratio of population variances. When we do want to carry out a hypothesis test, by far the most common test is that the ratio of variances is 1, or in other words, that sigma1 squared is equal to sigma2 squared. It's just as easy to test a value other than 1, but often this is the most natural test. If we end up rejecting this null hypothesis, that means we have strong evidence that the populations have different variances. And that's very meaningful for us in some situations. Here are the assumptions of the two sample inference procedures for variances that we're about to look at. We need simple random samples from the populations of interest, and we need those two samples to be independent. It's always important in statistics to have a good sampling design, and if we have a biased sampling design, then the results may be very misleading. And we need the populations to be normally distributed. It turns out that in inference procedures for variances, this is an extremely important assumption, even for large sample sizes. For many violations of the normality assumption, these procedures work very, very poorly, so poorly that using these procedures is always a bit dubious. If those assumptions are in fact true, then this quantity, s1 squared over sigma1 squared, 
divided by s2 squared over sigma 2 squared has an f distribution with n1 minus 1 degrees of freedom in the numerator and n2 minus 1 degrees of freedom in the denominator. We're going to use that fact to construct the appropriate confidence interval formula and the appropriate hypothesis test statistic. This simplifies a little bit if the population variances are equal, which is a common hypothesis that we wish to test. If the population variances are equal, then up here sigma 1 squared and sigma 2 squared are going to cancel out, and the f statistic now simplifies to the ratio of sample variances, s1 squared over s2 squared, and the ratio of sample variances is going to have an f distribution with n1 minus 1 and n2 minus 1 degrees of freedom. Now let's look at the appropriate confidence interval and hypothesis testing methods. A 1 minus alpha times 100% confidence interval, which will often choose to be a 95% confidence interval, for the ratio of population variances is given by this interval. We multiply the ratio of the sample variances by the reciprocals of the appropriate f quantiles. These f values are found from the f distribution with n1 minus 1 and n2 minus 1 degrees of freedom. I'm plotting in an f distribution here. The exact mean and variance and shape of the f distribution depend on the degrees of freedom, but I'm plotting in an f distribution here, and it typically looks quite a bit like this. f sub alpha over 2 is the f value that has an area to the right of alpha over 2, and f sub 1 minus alpha over 2 is the f value that has an area to the left of alpha over 2. We find these values from software or an f table, and we use them in this formula. If you're wondering why this is the appropriate confidence interval formula, I have another video in which I derive this formula, showing why this is the appropriate formula to use. We may wish to test the null hypothesis that the population variances are equal. We could test other hypotheses, like the hypothesis that sigma 1 squared is equal to 4 times sigma 2 squared, say. But a test of equality of variances is the most natural test that arises. We'll use one of these three alternative hypotheses. As per usual, the appropriate choice of alternative hypothesis depends on the problem at hand, and we'll use the two-sided alternative hypothesis unless we have a strong reason to be interested in only one side. To test the null hypothesis that the population variances are equal, we will use the f-test statistic that is simply the ratio of sample variances. If the null hypothesis is true, the population variances are in fact equal, and the normality assumption is true, this test statistic will have an f distribution with n1-1 and n2-1 degrees of freedom. So we will get the p-value for the test using the f distribution. Let's take a look at how we'll do that. Suppose we're testing the null hypothesis of equality of variances against the alternative hypothesis that sigma 1 squared is greater than sigma 2 squared. And this is our f test statistic. If the null hypothesis is true, then this test statistic will have an f distribution with the appropriate degrees of freedom. I'm going to draw in an f distribution here. Once we get our samples, we can calculate the f test statistic and see where it falls on this distribution. I'm letting f with a subscript of OBS for observed represent the observed value of the test statistic, the value of the ratio of sample variances. If this alternative hypothesis is correct, then s1 squared will tend to be greater than s2 squared, and the f test statistic will tend to fall in the right tail of the distribution. Values far out in the right tail give strong evidence against this null hypothesis and in favor of this alternative hypothesis. For this alternative, the p-value is the probability, under the null hypothesis, of getting the observed value of the test statistic or something even greater. And that's simply this area, the area to the right of the observed value of the test statistic. We'll find that area using software, but if we don't have access to software, we can approximate it with an f-table. Suppose we had this alternative hypothesis, that sigma 1 squared is less than sigma 2 squared. 
Here, small values of this test statistic, values in the left tail, near zero, give evidence against the null hypothesis and in favor of this alternative hypothesis. The p-value is the probability, under the null hypothesis, of getting the observed value of the test statistic or something less. And that's simply the area to the left of the observed value of the test statistic. Now suppose we had a two-sided alternative hypothesis. Here values far out in the right tail, or far out in the left tail, close to zero, give evidence against the null hypothesis and in favor of this alternative. The p-value is the probability, under the null hypothesis, of getting the observed value of the test statistic or something more extreme, something farther out in the tails. And we are again going to do something very similar to what we did in t-tests for means. We are going to take the area to the left or right of the test statistic, whichever is smaller, and we'll double it. Then we'll draw a conclusion in the usual ways. A very small p-value gives very strong evidence against the null hypothesis and in favor of the alternative hypothesis. And if we are carrying out the test at a set significance level alpha, we can reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis if the p-value is less than or equal to alpha. We could also say the evidence against the null hypothesis is statistically significant if the p-value is less than or equal to alpha. I worked through a complete example in another video, but let's take a quick look at the example from the start of this video. I'm not going to work through the calculations here, but we'll look at the results. Recall that we're investigating the variability in the 2D40 ratio in males born to parents who were first cousins and the ratio for males born to parents who were not related. And the related parent groups seem to have greater variability. Is there truly a difference in the variability? or is it reasonably likely to see a difference in variability like this simply due to chance? These F methods rely heavily on the normality assumption. These box plots don't look too bad here. We don't seem to have major outliers or strong skewness, so it might not be too bad to use these procedures. We really should plot normal quantile quantile plots to investigate the normality assumption further, but let's save that for another day. If we carry out the calculations for the confidence interval method discussed earlier, we'd get a 95% confidence interval for the ratio of population variances of 1.35 to 2.68. We can be 95% confident that the ratio of sigma 1 squared over sigma 2 squared lies within this interval. So it looks like the variance in the related parent group is between 1.35 and 2.68 times larger than the variance in the unrelated parents group. One important point to note here is that this entire interval lies to the right of 1. So a ratio of population variances of 1 is not really plausible here. And it really looks like the ratio is greater than 1. So we have pretty strong evidence that sigma 1 squared, the variance for the related parent group, is greater than sigma 2 squared, the variance of the unrelated parents group. That's what the interval tells us. But if we're interested in seeing if there is strong evidence of a difference in population variances, we can carry out a formal hypothesis test. If we wish to do so, here are the appropriate hypotheses. We'll test the null hypothesis that the population variances are equal against the alternative hypothesis that they are different. Before the study, we didn't know which group, if any, would have a greater variance, and we're interested in a difference in either direction, so I think a two-sided alternative is appropriate here. If we calculate the ratio of sample variances, we get an F statistic of approximately 1.89, and the corresponding two-sided p-value is very small, 0.00027. This is a very small p-value, giving very strong evidence against the null hypothesis. The evidence against the null hypothesis would be considered statistically significant at any of the usual significance levels, like 0.05 or 0.01, or even 0.001. There is very strong evidence against the null hypothesis that the population variances are equal, and in favor of the alternative hypothesis that there is a difference. And if we look at the sample variances where s1 squared is greater than s2 squared, 
That shows we have strong evidence that group 1, the related parent group, has a larger population variance than that of the unrelated parent group. And that shouldn't be too surprising, given what we saw in the 95% confidence interval. Let's look at a few important points. Once again, these methods can work very poorly when the normality assumption is violated. Levine's test and the closely related brown Forsyth test are alternative methods for testing equality of variances. They perform better than the F-test when the populations are not normal. When using an F-table, rather than software, it is a little easier to find areas and percentiles in the right tail of the distribution than areas and percentiles in the left tail simply because of the way f-tables are usually set up. And because of that, some sources suggest to always call the group with the larger sample variance group 1. In other words, always put the larger sample variance on top. This ensures the ratio of sample variances is greater than 1 and falls in the right tail of the distribution. That makes finding the p-value a little easier when we're using a table, but if we're using software, it doesn't matter which group we call group 1. In another video, I worked through a complete example of the inference procedures we discussed in this video.